My name's Dominic Power. I'm a consultant hand and peripheral nerve specialist based at the Birmingham Hand Centre in the UK. My specialist area of interest is the management of peripheral nerve injuries, including war nerve injuries. And I'm going to talk to you today about the classification of peripheral nerve injury. Now, a classification system allows accurate communication between clinicians. It also allows us to define the discrete nature of a nerve injury and therefore provide an accurate prognosis for patients and along with it to make a decision about whether operative intervention is required. Also an ideal classification system is accurate with very little inter-observer and intra-observer variabil variability and this allows direct comparison of treatments for the purposes of audit and research. Now a motor nerve cell contains a cell body located into the, in the anterior horn of the spinal cord. The cell body is where the nucleus is located. Transcription and translation of DNA allows generation of organelles and new materials to support the cell and its nutrition and also the neurotransmitter agents required for the motor end plate. The axon is the long projection from the cell body and this is supported along its course by Schwann cells. The cytoskeleton allows transport of organelles and neurotransmitter substances along the length of the nerve cell. Schwann cells are associated with all peripheral nerves and it is the degree to which they are related and the degree of involution and invagination of the axon that renders a nerve either myelinated or unmyelinated. Now within a peripheral nerve there are multiple bundles of nerve axons and these are of many different types. You will notice from the table that there are large diameter fibres and these tend to be myelinated for very fast saltatory or jumping conduction and these are muscle uh, efferent fibres and muscle afferent fibres controlling position. In addition there are some very fast myelinated high conducting velocity pain afferent fibres but then there are some other nerve fibre types within the nerve for slow pain and also for autonomic function and these tend to be smaller and unmyelinated. It is an understanding of these different fibre types and their degree of myelination that allows us to consider different types of nerve injury. When we're talking about the classification of a peripheral nerve injury we need to understand the microanatomy of the peripheral nerve. Each axon shown here in yellow lies within an endoneural tube supported by Schwann cells. These individual axons are bound together into fascicle groups embedded within perineural tissue. Between the fascicle groups is interfascicular epineurium and the whole lot is bundled together with an epineural layer and superficially within the epineural layer are the longitudinal vascular structures that supply nutrition and oxygenation to the nerve. The basic understanding of nerve physiology is that the membranes are able to generate a resting potential due to the relative different concentrations of sodium and potassium and the relative different conductances across the membrane. The sodium potassium ATPase pump allows exchange of these ions across the cell membrane generating a resting potential. When depolarization occurs there is a recruitment and opening of voltage gated sodium channels such that there is a change in conductance of sodium and then later a change in conductance of potassium across the cell membrane and this allows depolarization once threshold is reached and then rapid repolarization of the nerve. In order to conduct quickly as the surface area to volume ratio changes within a peripheral nerve and the nerve increases in diameter, Schwann cell invagination creates nodes of Ronvier and saltatory conduction can allow rapid propagation of nerve action potentials. The depolarization at the end plate, in this case a motor end plate, 
allows release of neurotransmitters across the synaptic cleft to receptors on the muscle. Now the first type of nerve injury that we can understand is a loss of the electrochemical gradient and conduction within a peripheral nerve. It's also possible to have segments of a nerve that become demyelinated and this will affect predominantly myelinated nerve types. The larger fast pain and also the large motor axons. With traction injuries it's possible to disrupt the axons within the nerve. Once the axon is detached from the cell body the distal axon undergoes Wallerian degeneration creating a degenerative axonopathy and it's possible for this axon to sprout and regrow slowly along the endoneural tube as long as the whole nerve is not transected. If the nerve is transected it will need to be realigned so the sprouting regenerating axon can find the right end target organ. Crush injuries or fracture fragments that are displaced or hematoma compress upon peripheral nerves and this renders the axon ischemic. Progressive pressure can result in apoptosis or a programmed cell death. This loss of nerve ability to regenerate is important when we consider late presenting nerve lesions. Nerves recover better when operated on or repaired early or when any, or when any adverse environment is dealt with promptly such as expanding hematoma affecting the nerve with compression. Now the early classification of nerve injury that was popularized by Seddon was based on observation of those injured soldiers from the First World War. The first term or neuropraxia was described as a loss of function within a nerve and an axonal injury with loss of the axon, a degenerative nerve lesion, was termed axontomesis. Neurotomesis is the term used for when the nerve is actually transected and requires surgical repair. To talk about neuropraxia, apraxia means the loss or impairment of the ability to execute complex coordinated movements without muscular or sensory impairment. This does imply that there's no structural damage to the nerve. However, this is not an appropriate term to use in our modern understanding of peripheral nerve injury. Axontomesis implies a cut axon, so a loss of axonal continuity with subsequent Wallerian degeneration, what is often termed axonopathy or degenerative axonopathy, and recovery can only re occur through axonal regrowth. It is possible in minor injuries to have spontaneous recovery without surgery but more severe types of axonal injury may require surgical intervention, which I will talk about later. This therefore is not an absolute classification that describes all types of axonal injury. Neurontomesis is a cut nerve and there's loss of the continuity of the axon and all of the supporting connective tissue. Wallerian degeneration occurs and recovery is not possible without a surgical repair. This definition still stands today. Sunderland in 1951 tried to explain why some patients suffering axonal injuries did better than others and he came up with a theoretical description of the injury level within the nerve. He talked about axonal disruption in isolation, axonal disruption with endoneural disruption and axonal disruption with perineural disruption and he implied that with progressive more internal damage within the nerve, a good successful outcome was less likely. So the classification that we have popularized for Sunderland implies neuropraxia, axonal disruption, endoneural disruption, perineural disruption and nerve transection. The perineural disruption do very poorly and these patients almost behave like a nerve transection. But this still begs the question about the definition of neuropraxia. Can one term used, be used to describe all types of non-structural nerve injury? 
Well, neuropraxia is a group of patients exhibiting different types of nerve injury. Some patients can recover within minutes or hours from injury, some within days, and some within months. But uniquely, the recovery in neuropraxia is spontaneous and complete. Can we explain these different pathologies in terms of what is actually happening in the type of nerve injury that we see? Nowadays, we use the term conduction block. Conduction block implies that there is no major structural damage to the nerve, but for some reason the nerve is not able to conduct electrical impulses. We talk about conduction blocks type A, in which there's intraneural circulatory arrest, so there's an ischemic event causing ionic block without structural damage, and this is reversible within minutes to hours. I would liken this to the pins and needles or paresthesia experienced by a patient with prolonged application for a tourniquet beyond 5 or 10 minutes, and this resolves very quickly. Physiological conduction block type B is related to intraneural edema. There is increased intraneural pressure. There's very little fibre pathology, although the edema may be seen with slight loss of fascicular definition on high-resolution ultrasound. Recovery here is within days to weeks because there are no intraneural lymphatics to clear this edema. This type of injury is seen with compression or traction on a peripheral nerve. Prolonged conduction block is when there is a local segmental myelin damage to the nerve. This tends to affect the larger nerve fibres that are myelinated more than other fibres within the nerve. And so motor and proprioceptive dysfunction can be seen, together with fast pain response. There's minimal autonomic dysfunction and no C-fibre involvement. There is no degenerative axonopathy and full and spontaneous recovery can occur within weeks to months, so long as the myelin is able to repair itself, which takes between 10 and 12 weeks. This will only occur if the injuring agent is removed. If the injury persists, such as an expanding hematoma or compression of a nerve from fracture fragments, then this type of prolonged conduction block may persist, or even with persistent pressure on a nerve, there may be apoptosis and cell death, resulting in a higher level of nerve injury. Using the comprehensive classification system, the axonal injury in isolation, as described in the Sunderland 2, is a rapidly recovering injury to the nerve with correct target re with no cross-wiring. All of the axons will regenerate and they will track down the original endoneural tubes at fast rates up to 4 mm per day. And this can be examined with an advancing Tinel sign. Full recovery is expected within weeks to months, depending on the distance of regeneration. When the endoneural tubes within the nerve are damaged in addition to the axons, there is more disruption of the nerve and some intrafascicular scar formation. Axons trying to regrow may be misdirected with sensory and motor mixing. Axonal regrowth tends to be slower through the scarred bed at 1 to 2 mm per day, and recovery is often incomplete. Duration of recovery is again dependent on how far the injury is from the end organs. Once there is perineural damage within the nerve, there is much more extensive scarring. There is distal degeneration. The scar results in gross axonal misdirection and normally a neuroma in continuity is the consequence. If any axons manage to get through the scar, their rate of progression is very slow, usually less than one millimeter per day. Because of the degree of scarring, the prognosis is poor and there is much cell loss due to apoptosis. And generally there is no significant motor or sensory recovery and surgery is often involved in these cases in order to optimize outcome. Neurontomesis is the transection of a nerve where air and degeneration occurs. And of course, surgery is imperative if any recovery is to be attained. But the outcome of this type of injury is dependent on both local and systemic factors. So the comprehensive classification system that I use for peripheral nerve injury is a physiological conduction block type A, which is intraneural circulatory arrest and ischemia, type B, edema, 
prolonged conduction block with demyelination, then progressive axonal loss with disruption of axons in isolation, then endoneurium, then perineurium, and then the neurotomesis. If we liken the peripheral nerves as a railway line that's electrified, the physiological conduction block type A is like blowing a fuse. Once the fuse is replaced, within a few minutes, the electricity can be restored and conduction will occur. When there's a DMO, in this case flooding on the line, it takes a little longer, often up to two weeks, for the tissues to dry out to allow restoration of normal conduction. If the myelinated layer, which in this case is the embankment, is damaged, this will need to be cleared and replaced in order for conduction to occur. There is no underlying structural damage to the endoneurium or the axon, and this I would liken as a prolonged conduction block. If there's disruption of the track in this case, this is akin to disruption of the axon and isolation in the Sunderland grade 2 injury. Once the supporting tissue is also damaged, in this case the sleepers and subtrack support, this is almost the same as having damage to the endoneural tube. It's possible to get restoration of the electrical signal, but it does require some reconstruction and regrowth of the axon and some of the supporting tissue. Once there is more extensive damage, in this case with perineural disruption, there is more damage to the nerve and more chance of miswiring during recovery. And neurontomesis results in transection of a nerve with gross disruption requiring surgical repair. I hope you find that this has helped in your understanding of peripheral nerve injuries. Many thanks for listening.